Dr. Chow, you're joining us right now. We're talking about this, uh, the, the FTD dementia. Uh, why would a person consider genetic testing to figure this out? The uh, proportion of patients, persons living with FTD that carry a genetic mutation that has caused the disease is actually higher than in other causes of dementia like Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. Up to 40% of persons living with FTD have a very strong family history that will be suspicious for a genetic mutation. And if a person does have that genetic mutation, that person has a 50-50 chance of passing it on to each of their children. Well, from the, from the sounds of it, it sounds like, uh, is there any specific time that you should possibly have that genetic testing done on you? What, at your 50s, 60s, mm, 70s? So I, I would not recommend that there be blanket genetic testing for it. As, as daunting as the symptoms are, the, the, the best, most effective way to identify genetic mutations is to make sure that the person who's already been test, uh, who's been diagnosed with FTD gets the genetic test. And if that person has one of the genetic mutations, then you would talk to other family members about what their options may be. And they, everybody has a different uh, feeling about whether they should have the genetic testing done. Uh, it's important to know that the context of this is that currently there are no FDA approved therapies that are specific oh. to frontotemporal dementia. So people have different feelings about whether they want to know. Right. Mm. Oh. That is that dilemma. Uh, doctor, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, besides the genetic testing, what other research is going on right now in the world of FTD? What, what are we doing? It's, uh, we hear a lot in medicine. We're just treating the symptoms. We're not working right. towards us. Right. So because it's a rare dementia, this is responsible for about 60,000 cases in the United States compared to millions with Alzheimer's disease. There are multiple lines of research. Number one, to figure out what is happening in the brain chemistry that accompanies the changes that lead to a person becoming so disabled what is the course of illness like so that we can support our families, prepare them for what they're facing ahead? And then, of course, developing therapies that, that uh, will be more specific to the mechanism of frontotemporal dementia. And we're actively looking for potential therapies among several lines um, and hoping to change that statistic about where the FDA is currently for approvals. You know, we talk a whole lot about the, the, the this this form of disease, uh, but there are some things that can bring it on. Like, uh, take Bruce Willis for instance, uh, aphasia. Uh, whoa, that's hey, one minute he's all right, next minute, uh, uh, no, we ain't going there. Uh, mm -hmm. What, what, what's up with that? What, what can trigger something like this? So it's interesting. Frontotemporal dementia is called that because it affects the front half of the brain. Okay. One of the important functions of the front half of the brain is to manage your language skills. Okay. And so the fluency with which you speak can be one of the key and initial things triggered. Other people may have more of a behavioral change as their presentation of FTD. And I have to point out that none of these things actually happens to uh, happens overnight. There are gradual changes over time. And that's what makes this so difficult to diagnose. There are misdiagnoses because of the age at which people start to have these very initial mild symptoms. Patients are much younger than those with Alzheimer's disease. Patients with FTD are in their 50s or even earlier in life. And that's not a time when people even think of the word dementia. Right, mm -hmm. right. So if right. there's a challenge to diagnose it and then to not diagnose it as a midlife crisis or a depression or work exhaustion, um, but to get to 
the fact that there is FTD. And we have with us today uh, Deb Sharper, uh, who is a caregiver to someone with FTD and suffered this delay in diagnosis. Deb, that's a question I want to get to you. Uh, is What do you want people and caregivers especially to know about living with FTD, a patient who's dealing with this? FTD is a devastating disease. Uh, it first started in our family at the age of 38. We saw signs um, of Tommy changing. Um, he was our my loved one. We were married in 1991, and he started changing at the age of 38. He was unable to complete normal tasks. We owned and operated a business, and all of a sudden, he couldn't complete easy tasks, and he had a personality change. He did no longer loved, um, he was a huge demolition derby man, and all of a sudden, he didn't want to even do those activities. He became introverted. He became um, standoffish to our children. We had young kids, and he didn't even want to be around us very much. It totally changed our <laughs> living, mm -hmm. and it... Um, was devastating to our family. At the young of the age of 44, he was no longer able to keep a job. And um, I'm still, I'm in my young 40s trying to make managing the life. Um, our daughter was a senior in high school. And at this age, um, we actually had to put him in a nursing home because we couldn't trust him at home anymore. Um, he had behavioral issues along with, we couldn't keep him out of a darn car. He kept on driving and we'd get him lost. And right. sometimes I'd be like, oh, I better the cops to try and find him you know because I didn't know where he was at and I'm at work and so it was just safer for him and for us to have him be put in a nursing home and it's devastating on the family it's devastating on everybody um, I'm looking into a man's eyes that I was loved I still love him dearly but looking at a different man that I no longer knew 38 years old that has to be very taxing <laughs> in itself I mean, you know, yes. here's somebody, you know, love, honor, love, honor, cherish, and all of a sudden we're in a different different mindset, literally, on, on, on your part as well as his. Uh, how do you like, cope like, with yes. that? Um, every day is a challenge. You know, right now he's 52 years old. He lives two and a half hours from us in a nursing home. And um, we just love him where he's at today. Um, once he got diagnosed with FTD, we definitely started research right away. And right. We, we found out that he has the genetic code. And um, my kids now are in childbearing ages. And both of them decided that, you know what, we have to figure this out. We do not want this to go on to the next generation. Right. Um, can you imagine as a mom knowing that your kids have a 50-50 chance of having this disorder also. Um, our daughter is being um, loud and proud and we are being knowledge is power and we are going to fight every way we can. And we are saying to everybody, genetic testing, don't be afraid. Um, if we do not show um, our codes, how are scientists going to be able to find a way right. to um, stop this this disorder? So that's our mission in life is to help and hopefully get more families to don't be afraid of your code. We can't change it. So why not let the scientists help us do that? Now, doctor, can you tell us where we can find out more information on FTD? Since FTD is so rare, I will not be surprised if listeners are hearing about this for the first time and are kind of overwhelmed with what they've heard. Um, if you want to learn any more about the illness itself or um, some of the other lines of research that are available, please visit learnftd.com. Thank you, Dr. Chow, Deb, Alyssa. Thank you for your time today. Very informative. We really appreciate your help. Thank you for your time. Anytime. We'll take a quick break. We're back with more chat right after this on Newsday Amarillo and News Channel 10 2.